Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed preparing it. I enjoyed preaching it, but it was too much, but uh, that's all right. We, we do that with our meals, and it's all right to do it with a sermon once in a while. Now, we're looking at the home tonight. Now, I was having a little bit of a laugh here while we were singing. It wasn't anything to do with the song we were singing. Um, I had a couple of uncles that were pastors. My, my dad's brothers were both pastors, Baptist pastors. And I remember hearing my uncle, one of them, preach. Uh, my middle name is his, I got from him, Everett. Um, he was preaching on hell. And he said, uh, you know, I pick out the songs. He said, you know, there's no good songs on hell. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking that there's not a whole lot of hymns in our hymnal about the home, is there? I came across a couple, The Fight Is On. The old account was settled long ago. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't want to make fun, but it did make me laugh as I was, I was actually looking to see, do we have any songs in there on, on the home? Yeah, there, there are some good ones, but uh, the, the theme of 1 Peter, we're in 1 Peter tonight, the theme is Christian conduct in a wicked world, uh, dealing with suffering, really, and it was written to... Uh, Christians that were scattered, uh, some of them going through, through persecution. A and the home fits in there as well. You know, no matter what our circumstances, we still need to live godly lives. Uh, even when we're scattered and persecuted, uh, husbands need to love their wives, wives need to submit to their husbands, and we need to have godly homes. Uh, we've seen uh, in... Uh, in 1 Peter, that God gives us, calls, or I should say, calls us to hope and to holiness. You know, we're, we're a people, Christians are people who have hope. In um, 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, you know, that hope leads us to holiness. Because we know Jesus is coming, Man, we, we have a responsibility to live for him. And he talks there in verse 14 and 15 about being holy in our, in our lives. And he calls us to honor. There in verse 17, uh, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Fear has to do with, with honor. And it's an important thing to stop and think about. What do you fear? What do you honor in your life? We've probably all had times when you, you see, you're driving along, and you see a policeman, and, oh, you check your speedo, and, you know, everything, you know, you, you honor their, their authority, um, as long as you see them. Uh, we need to honor the Lord, uh, not just when it's convenient. Uh, we need to honor His Word, and He talks here in First Peter about honoring authorities, you know, giving submission to, to those that God puts over us, uh, servants to their masters. And in those days, it, it was real servants and real masters. Uh, you know, in, in our day, in, in Australia, we don't have slavery, but uh, they did. And uh, God, God said, in that situation, uh, you need to, first of all, submit to the Lord and be the best. If, if you get saved as a servant, be the best servant you can. Uh, bosses, and then we're getting into chapter 3, we're getting into the, to the home. He talks about living in harmony. But we've looked at a lot of things. But you know, Christianity starts with our relationship to God. That's the key. Without that, nothing else makes sense. With it, everything else falls into place. And uh, our relationship to God then leads us to be right in the other relationships around us. There's lots of different relationships we have. Some permanent, some temporary, and so on. And, and as Christians, we need to have Christian conduct in a wicked world. You know, we can't base it on the world that we're in. Here were these Christians scattered, different places, lots of different cultures, lots of different things going on. They couldn't base how they lived based on where they were or the situations around them. They had to look to the Lord. What's the right way to live? Same for us, isn't it? Uh, you know, as Christians, we're not, we're not rebels. God doesn't want us to be rebels. Uh, we're to be in submission to God. And, you know, the world is watching. They're seeing what our home is like. Well, what we're like at work, uh, what we're like paying our taxes and, you know, driving our cars and, and so on. Uh, tonight we're looking at uh, the area of the home. Now, if God wrote this to scattered, persecuted Christians, man, this should be easy for us, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. Uh, it, it's still tough uh, to, to be right in, in all of our relationships. 
But the home is so basic, isn't it? I mean, you know, even as an old man myself now, you still think about your parents and your brothers and sisters and, you know, the, the home that you grew up in and how, how that affected you. It's real important what our home is like. I believe chapter 3 here is written particularly to mixed marriages uh, where one is a Christian and one is not. But it applies to every marriage. Um, in those days, evidently, it was pretty tough, um, particularly for women that got saved whose husbands weren't saved. Uh, they were just considered property. There was many cultures of that day where a, a husband could just pretty much kill his wife and nobody would bat an eye, you know. It was, they, were just, uh, they were just something there. So as a, as a Christian woman, uh, God gives them some instructions, and then he gives some instructions to men as well, uh, dealing with the situations. Now, most of you are going to have to apply this to, to a normal marriage, and, and that's good. We can, we can do that. Some of you are not married. You'll just have to apply it uh, to your life in general. But let's read 1 Peter 3. I'll start in verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be the, that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So we'll stop reading there. Uh, he starts talking particularly to the wife. Now, I, I find a lot of things in Scripture, even though they're directed to the women or to the men, uh, we all can get something out of it. And uh, so there's, there's things here for all of us, but particularly for a wife who is in a situation where her husband wasn't saved. Uh, God calls them, first of all, to submission. He uses the word there, subjection. He starts with the word likewise. And when you, when you see something like that, you, you know there's something that's come before, likewise. And the, illust the, the subject right before that was Jesus and how that uh, he suffered for us, leaving us an example that we, we should follow in his steps and, and so on. Uh, the verses just before chapter 3 are talking about the example that Jesus gave us. He says, likewise, like Jesus. And I found it really interesting that if you look up that word subjection, it's used about Jesus in relation to his parents. In Luke 2, 51, it says he, he went down with them, with his parents, came to Nazareth, Nazareth and was subject unto them. Jesus submitted himself to his parents. Here's the God of the universe submitting himself as a child to, to his parents. And, and that's what God is saying here to, to wives. Uh, he, let, let me give you three things about this thing of submission. Number one, submission is an obligation. Did you notice God puts it pretty plainly here? Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, if that was written today, uh, by, uh, without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, uh, people would say something like, uh, you know, if it's convenient and, and you feel like it, you know, maybe sometimes you should kind of, you know, maybe once in a while give in to your husband a little bit. <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd waffle. God doesn't waffle at all about that. It's, it's a very plain statement, isn't it? That ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. God commands it. And God doesn't command it because he thinks women are inferior to men. Uh, the Bible says very plainly later on, we, as we read in verse 7, we're heirs together. Uh, in, in Galatians, he talks about how in Christ there's neither male nor female. You know, salvation is not different for men or, or for women. Uh, we're the same before God spiritually, but... On the practical side, God has an order of things. And, and that's exactly the way that, that word is used. Subjection is a, is a military term. 
Can you imagine a military where nobody was in charge? What do we do? I don't know. <laughs> you know, with the military, somebody tells somebody, and they tell somebody, and it gets done, hopefully. And uh, God knows that for a family to work, there's got to be order to it. And uh, God, first of all, says submission is an obligation. But you know, secondly, submission is an opportunity. That's what he says there in verses 1 and 2, that, that also, uh, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. It's an opportunity to win an unsaved mate. Yeah, as a person lives for the Lord, other people see that. And more than just our actions, they see our spirit. That, that's so important. It's a powerful influence when done with the fruit of the spirit. If we'll have a submissive attitude, a character and conduct will win a lost husband, not arguments. Yeah, we're not going to argue people into the kingdom. Uh, and when he says without the word, I don't think he means that we throw our Bible out. He's just saying we don't have to do a lot of talking. People are, are watching our example. What's the old saying? What you are, speak so loud that the world can't hear what you say. There's people that it'll be hard to witness to if you've spoiled your testimony about what you've said and done. Uh, we, need to have, uh, we need to take the opportunity and, and live submissive lives. Uh, I've heard, I, I tried to think of some of the different things I've heard of how women have tried to get their, their husbands saved. Uh, I heard of one where... Uh, she would, she would cry all the time. Oh, please, get saved, get saved. And he, it was a husband who even came to church with her. And her pastor advised her not to talk to her husband about the Lord for a year. And after six months, he got saved. <laughs> uh, yeah, she'd just been badgering him so much, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't take it, you know. Um, submission is an opportunity. And I've heard testimony several uh, of men or women who've gotten saved because of the testimony of their husband or wife. And uh, it's an obligation, but it's also an opportunity. Thirdly, God says it's an ornament. Did you notice that? That word comes up a couple of times there. Uh, verse 3, who's adorning? Uh, verse 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart. I've always thought it funny that women have a hidden man of the heart. <laughs> In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. It's a valuable thing that we have a submissive spirit, starting with our attitude toward God. It's an adorning. Again, I like looking up what these, where these words come from. The word adorning is the word cosmos. Have you heard that before? The cosmos, the universe. It has to do with the order of the universe. It's also where we get our word cosmetics from. <laughs> um, the opposite is chaos. In, in verse 3, you know, sometimes people, people say, oh, you know, women shouldn't do hairstyles or wear jewelry or so on. Well, if you say that, they, they can't wear clothes either because he says the putting on of apparel. Uh, he's not saying don't mess with your hair and don't wear jewelry or uh, don't... I'm not sure what to say there. <laughs> can't get out of that one. Uh, he's saying that's not your main focus. Yeah, that's not what we live for. We don't live for what our hair looks like or what our makeup does or uh, you know, what our clothes are, are like. Uh, the, the battlefield is submission. And people are going to see our heart. They're going to care more about our heart. I often encourage young people, you know, I guess old people too, uh, sometimes people worry about how they look. I encourage people, look around, look at your friends. Do you like them because of how they look? Most of our friends are, look just like us, you know. They're as ugly as we are. <laughs> and we love them, you know. Don't, don't worry, that's not the main focus for our life. Uh, the battlefield is submission. Us being submitted to God. Being submitted in the relationships that, that God gives us. Uh, it, it's a battlefield in our world today that's tearing homes apart. It, it's destroying children. Uh, this thing of homosexuality, it, it, it has a lot to do with this, this subject that we're talking about tonight. Uh, it's, it's, it's hurting a lot of people. Uh, we need to submit to the Lord. We need to submit to those that God puts over us. So, first of all, God calls the wife to submission. Secondly, in verse 2, you might say he calls her to faithfulness. Now, again, this is true for all of us, isn't it? Uh, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, chaste has to do with being pure. 
uh, fear, reverence, honor. And we need to live lives that are, are right before God. We need to be faithful to the Lord. Yeah, a, a wife being submissive to her husband doesn't mean that she'll do anything. Uh, I don't believe that. And I know there's people that, that teach that. Uh, you know, there's things that God says not to do. And uh, there's, there's just sometimes when we have to obey the Lord rather than, rather than man. We need, but we need to be faithful people. The one that comes to my mind in this is Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember Joseph when his brothers sold him into slavery? And uh, you know, he ended up a, a, in a home where the woman was committing sexual harassment and trying to get him to be immoral with her. And, and his comment was, how can I do this thing and sin against my God? See, he knew he needed to be faithful to the Lord. And he ended up in prison as, as a result. Uh, he, he was a faithful man, and uh, that's what God calls us to, to be faithful. Uh, the third thing, he calls, calls us to modesty there in verse 4. Uh, that's what verses 3 and 4 are about. He's saying we're, we're not just living for the outward, you know, what people see and so on. He, he says, let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of, of great price. Uh, you know, we don't need to be preoccupied with our looks. It's interesting. I think this would have been something that would have uh, been common in Noah's day. You know, people, I think people would have had a, a lot of cosmetics and things that they were, they were doing uh, with their looks. I, I know it was a, a problem in Isaiah's day. Let me read you uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verses 18 and following. And most of these, we won't even know what they are. But I don't know what most of the things our people wear today either. So uh, Isaiah 3.18. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their coals and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets. Hey, you already had uh, tablets in those days. And the earrings, the rings and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils and shall come to pass that instead of a sweet smell, there shall be a stink. Man, I think he listed 20 different things there. And the people of that day, they'd have known exactly what, what I was reading there. I, most of them, I don't have a clue what they are. I looked up some of them. Uh, that tire and, and different things had to do with different jewelry and, and so on. You know, today, people have all, all kinds of things that they, they think, well, I was just saying to my wife today, uh, some of the things people put on, I, I said to her, how in the world could they think that could look good? <laughs> you know, putting a ring in your nose, man, I find that so hard to look people in the eye when they got a ring in their nose. Uh, uh, God doesn't want us to be preoccupied. He doesn't want us to just do what everybody else does. He wants us to be faithful and modest and, and submissive. Makeup cannot change an ugly disposition. Have you ever noticed some of these, the, the world's most beautiful people can't keep a husband or a wife? You ever notice that? You know, the people that are in the news a lot, now some of them can, they're, some of them are, are faithful people, but uh, a lot of them, they're so messed up inside, oh, they look beautiful outside, but that's, that's not what gives you fellowship with someone. It's the heart that you fellowship with. And uh, what a blessing it is to have to have good fellowship. There's a similar verse to the one we're looking at in, in Peter in 1 Timothy 2. Let me just read two verses there. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. In verse 8, he talks about praying and lifting up holy hands. And, and he says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Very, very similar to what he, he says in, in Peter there. And he uses that term shamefacedness. You know, we're living in a day where, where there's no modesty. You know, there, there's no shame. And as Christians, there needs to be a sense of shame. There's things that you know, we, we don't want people to see. There's things we don't want to, people to... Uh, to experience from us, you know, we, we need a sense of, of modesty. Uh, the, the illustration he gives here in verses 5 and 6 is Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now, 
I thought that was interesting this morning. We're looking at Romans, and God uses Abraham as an illustration uh, of uh, justification. But now here, here in Peter, he uses Sarah as an illustration of submission and faithfulness. Did you ever stop and think about what it would have been like to be Sarah? Yeah, Abraham has this great experience with God, and he comes home to his wife. Sarah, I've had a great experience with God. Pack up. We're leaving tomorrow. Oh, Abraham, where are we going? I don't know. God will tell us when we get there. Can you, I mean, you women, can you imagine? Some, some husbands do that to their wives without God telling them to move. Uh, but uh, here's, here's a woman, and you never read about her in, in relation to that, giving him a hard time. She, she called him, yes, Abraham. Let's get ready. Let's go. I guess, you know. I guess when we get to heaven, we'll find out all the words that were said. But it says, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. The phrase I like, uh, not afraid with any amazement. You know, a, lot of, a lot of women are amazed at their husbands. Uh, but uh, she wasn't afraid. She, she didn't let fear stop her from doing what Abraham said God had told them to do. That would have been easy to be, have been afraid. Oh, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? Where will we be? How will we live? Uh, Submission is not out of fright. You know, a woman shouldn't, shouldn't have to be in submission because she's afraid. She should do it because it's right. Now, there's, there are plenty of people who live in fear, uh, but that's not the, the motivation that God is looking for here. Sarah didn't do that because she was afraid of Abraham. She did it because she feared the Lord, because she loved the Lord and honored him. So uh, God gives us several things there for, for the women. Submission. Uh, faithfulness, modesty, and of course that applies to, to all of us, doesn't it? Then we come to the men, and again he starts with the word in verse 7, likewise. I think he's relating it to the women, but also back to Jesus and uh, to how, how Jesus gave us the example. And uh, for the husband, let me read verse 7 again. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, as husbands and wife and in a family, we all have areas of submission. I think it's important to notice that when he talks about this in Ephesians, as he gets into the subject, the very first verse, uh, Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Husbands have an area of submission. Wives have an area have areas of submission. And then he goes, wives, husbands, and, and so on. They're, they're in Ephesians. And you know, as, as husbands, uh, we don't submit to the authority of our wife, but we do submit to God's authority and to the needs of our wife. Now, we have a responsibility uh, to submit. It's no good saying, oh, well, I'm the head of this house and you know, just uh, calling on our authority for whatever we want. Uh, we have to see those that God has given us responsibility for. You know, we expect that in politics. You know, we elect these people, and we expect them to meet our needs, don't we? Well, wife, a wife has every right to expect a husband to look after her, meet her needs, and to submit to God in, in doing what God has called, called him to. Um, he submits to God's order. A husband has an obligation, a command, to love his wife. Husbands, love your wives. Uh, this is some wisdom I wish I could get across to every couple. Uh, wives, your job is not to make your husband love you. That's not your job. Your job is to submit to your husband. Husbands, your job is not to make your wife submit to you. That's not your job. That's between her and the Lord. Your job is to love her. Now, that's hard, isn't it? But it's true. You know, as, as a husband, I don't have to chase Doyle around and, and say, now you do this and you do that. But I do need to chase around and love her. Uh, you know, I need to make sure that I, I'm doing, doing my part. And listen, I've never had any, any complaint uh, about her submitting to the Lord. Uh, sorry, I, I guess I've got to be careful what I'm saying here. could be taken <laughs> wrong ways. Uh, what's your job? You know, where do you fit in the family? If you're a child, there, you have a part. If you're an adult, you have a part. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for a husband to be saved and his wife not. You know, we, we think quite often of, of women who are saved and their husbands aren't. But, you know, we, we experience in our church and 
uh, in situations where, where the husband's saved. I've, I've seen it a lot in my ministry. Um, and, and, you know, husbands and wives don't always understand how everything works. I, I remember hearing a young couple having a discussion, and uh, the, the wife said to the husband, don't ask me how I heard this, but anyway, uh, I, I, it was, I did actually hear it. She said to him, I don't know why you ask me what I think, and then don't do what I say. <laughs> I thought, she doesn't understand something there about the process. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we need to understand where, where we fit. Um, what does God say for husbands to do? Well, there's, there's several areas here. In, uh, in verse 7, he says, Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Uh, you might use the word here, consideration. Uh, there's, there's knowledge that we need to have. We need to know our wife. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be respectful. We need to understand how, how life works, how women are different. You know, the world is trying to say, I heard a, the statement the other day about, uh, what was the first word, sexual equality, or you know, the things they're talking about nowadays. And it just struck me, I thought, that's, that's so dumb. You know, we're different. We're not the same, men and women. <laughs> the French used to say, vive la différence. <laughs> uh, you know, we're different. Uh, we're not supposed to be exactly the same. God made men, God made women. And uh, men need to understand that. Men, women oftentimes, you may not know this, husbands, but they don't always respond like men do. You say something thinking, boy, the men would say this. Well, they might say just the opposite. Well, you need to, need to get an understanding of how, how things work. Be thoughtful, be respectful. And in knowing them, um, he leads on then to the next one, honor them. Uh, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Uh, it's a big mistake if a husband doesn't honor his wife's thoughts and opinions and values. You know, things that are, are valuable to her, you know, big mistake if you think, oh, that's, that's worthless. Uh, I heard a guy, on, on, he was on TV, um, saying, oh, my wife, you know, she just looks after the house. She doesn't bring any money into the home. I thought, man, that, there's a fellow, he's heading for a divorce. Uh, he, he doesn't know her. He doesn't honor her. Uh, you might use the word chivalry. That, that's an old-fashioned word, isn't it? Uh, but a husband should protect his wife, should provide for her. Uh, God, has, God does not know the term house husband. Uh, men are to, are to provide. Now, there, there could be a circumstance where a man was disabled and, and couldn't leave the home and, and, and so on, and, and, but he's able to do some things at home. Uh, I, I'm not, not saying that that would never happen. But God has given a, a standard for, for marriage. In Ephesians, he uses the terms nourish and cherish. Husbands, we should nourish and cherish. Uh, we should want them to be the, the best person that they can be. Uh, consideration, chivalry. And then he talks about being heirs together. Companionship. Uh, he says, being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, earlier he'd said dwell with them. <coughs> Some men when they're home aren't home. Men, when you're home, be home. Uh, don't say, oh, I've been at work all day. I need... No, listen, you've been at work all day so you can go home and be with your family. Be with your family. Uh, spend time with, with your wife and, and if you have children in the home. Uh, in our marriage, we should have friendship. Uh, your husband, your wife should be your best friend. I, I said to Dempsey the other day, I was seeing Doyle, I said, that's the most important woman in the world to me. <laughs> oh, he, <laughs> he looked, he asked me a couple questions. Uh, yeah, that, that's the way it should be. Uh, your husband, your wife, that should be your best friend. That should be the most important person uh, in your life. And he talks here about enjoying the grace of life. Listen, that's what a marriage should be about, enjoying the grace of life together. Uh, it's love on every level, physical, intellectual, emotional, and it will affect the spiritual. Did you notice he said that, that your prayers be not hindered? Now, I think, you can disagree with me on this, but... I think the particular prayer he's talking about is, Lord, save my, my husband. Lord, I love my husband, but he's not saved. Lord, please save him. Lord, save my wife. You know, if, if we'll follow God's instructions and be in submission to him 
and be the kind of person God wants us to be, it's more likely that that person will come to Christ. God help us to do that. Some years ago, I had a man in our church that, whose wife was not saved. and I remember he said to me one day, he said, Pastor, I haven't talked to my wife in 30 days. I said, oh, brother, what are you doing? Uh, listen, we, we can't just uh, ignore what God says and expect to get God's results. Uh, as, as a husband, as a Christian, uh, as a, in his situation, you know, he needed to be the godly one in that home. He couldn't wait for her to do it. God expects us as men to lead. And uh, for me, sometimes that means I'm the first one who says I'm wrong. And uh, that's, that's part of leadership. And in the home, that's, that's important. I don't want to get too negative here, but uh, much of this applies to, to mixed marriages, where one, one the husband or the wife is lost. Uh, it, it applies to every marriage. Uh, these are things that, that will help us in... Uh, in other relationships, other, other than marriage, just in, in dealing with, with people in general. And he's talking about living for God in a wicked world. P particularly, he's talking about living for God in a difficult marriage. Really, we're basically just talking about living for God, aren't we? <laughs> uh, some of you are too young to, to be married. Well, listen, you can live for God. Uh, you can get along with your teachers and your classmates and your neighbors. And Man, it's, it's good practice for heaven. Uh, and he ends up, I love verses 8 and 9. Look at these. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. Listen, I want to inherit a blessing. Do you? <laughs> I do. And uh, God tells us here some of the things we can do that will help us to inherit a blessing. Blessings in our homes. Blessings in our community. Uh, you know, you can, you can make a situation worse or you can make it better. God help us to make our, our, our situations better, whatever, whatever our situation is that we're living in. Uh, God help us to live in submission to Him. Uh, this evening I thought we'd finish with a couple verses uh, from the song Cleanse Me. It's page 534. In, in your songbook there. Let's just do verse 1 and 3, Azrael. Page 534. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Honor in the home. 